Welcome to today's innovation live stream. Um, we're going to be talking about the balance changes that we've been making for Innovation Deluxe, uh, what we've got going on for the base game, which are pretty much finalized. Um, also, some changes to Echoes, which are still in the works. And then also a couple changes we made to Artifacts to uh, make things a little more interesting. Uh, so somebody asked in the stream, will all the revised cards be made in the uh, classic style? Uh, so yes, we're going to be able to um, put all the cards up in, in all the styles available. Obviously we're not doing yellow styles, that's not our business, but maybe they'll update theirs too. Uh, so yes, anybody who's staying Legacy will be able to get art to make paste-ups or print-on-demand cards uh, for any of these changes, which is good for everybody. So, uh, let's take a look at the cards we've been changing. So, for the base set, uh, the first card we're changing is Ores. And Ores is one of those lovely Age 1 cards, which before said, I demand you transfer a card with a uh, crown from your hand to your my score pile. If you do, draw one. Uh, what we're changing that to is, if you do draw one and repeat this dogma effect, so when ores hits, it's going to hit again. And it just makes ores a little bit more palatable to use. Um, it wasn't really that exciting of a card, uh, but this makes it a little more, little more powerful and also more interesting. Because if somebody's, we wanted more cards in uh, the base set that dealt with large hands, uh, and this is a good way to have one of them. So, um, Next up is a card that we didn't realize was broken slash overpowered until well beyond Innovation's release, uh, which is Fermenting. So Fermenting used to read, draw two for every two leaves on your board. Um, for the first year that Innovation was out, this was considered like a terrible card. Nobody was using it. I rarely used it. Occasionally, you know, you draw a couple of twos or three twos. Uh, and then Isotropic came out and people started experimenting with things and suddenly fermenting became this engine card where people would just go exclusively for leaves and just ferment their way to drawing dozens of cards into their hand and breaking everything. This was not good. Uh, so we have decided to update fermenting to draw two for every color on your board with a leaf. So. Whereas before, fermenting would get into Reformation and um, just snowball, because Reformation would let you tuck all those cards that you, that you had grabbed with fermenting and then get lots more leaves and just go nuts. Uh, this restricts you much more heavily. Uh, be, since, since there aren't an equal number of leaves in all the colors, it's a lot harder to get fermenting from 2 to 3 to 4 to maybe even 5 uh, with expansions than it was before to get fermenting up to six, seven, eight, or nine, where you're drawing an entire stack every dogma activation. Um, so we think this was a really good change because it makes fermenting interesting. You, you can still get a lot of cards with fermenting and it's still a good card, but it's not uh, the runaway engine that it was. Um, it is still a card I would meld and use. And uh, in fact, we saw Kat and Julia use it during the live stream. I forgot who had it, but they used it. It was good, it was reasonable. Um, but it wasn't like the only card they were activating all game long. Um, so we, oh, hold on, let me bring up my card list because I lost it. Oops. Good job, Google. <laughs> uh, the third change we made, and we're just going up in ascending age order because that's the easiest way for me to get through this spreadsheet, uh, was to what was pretty much universally called the worst card in the game, and that, of course, is Feudalism. So Feudalism used to steal a card, but only a card with a castle, and it would give you a yellow or purple left play. Um, meh, not very exciting. I think, if anything, people usually used Feudalism to get that splay left for, um, for invention, uh, and that was really the only reason you'd ever use Feudalism. Uh, but now... If you hit with Feudalism, you unsplay the color of their cards that you stole, which means that Feudalism can have a 
nice comeback and like unsplay and upsplayed pile from somebody if uh, they've got uh, if you leave feudalism hanging around until late age, which is pretty cool. Uh, it is the only card now in the base set that has the unsplay uh, keyword uh, mechanic. There are a couple later on in other sets. Um, and it just makes feudalism much more interesting. So also has a cool crown now. So next up on our list is a card called Measurement. And let me grab it. There's measurement. So, uh, measurement used to say you may return a card from your hand if you do display any one color of your cards right and then draw a card of value equal to the number of cards of that color on your board. And this does not have the update in it. Um, what happened? Hmm. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, it does. Sometimes I forget the subtle change you made. Uh, measurement now splays that color of your cards right and draws a card equal to uh, that color. So this does not dramatically change measurement, um, but it does restrict it from being... from. Measurement was not usually a problem in base-only games. Measurement was more of a problem in base plus figures plus echoes games because you can get a larger stack of cards in those and uh, it gets out of hand quickly. Um, with this, now you have to at least have the right color of card in your hand to do the thing. So we're still looking at it, but I think this brings it down to the level we want the card at um, in order to make it not, you know, ruin those games by having a runaway. What would happen is somebody would have seven or eight or nine cards of one color, uh, and this was especially a problem with the fermenting tucking engine. Um, and they would just jump from age five to nine without much effort. Or jump from age five to end the game if they managed to get 11 cards down in a color. But by restricting the color that you can uh, target with measurement, that should be less of an issue. Uh, one of the changes that we just made, uh, we just made this change yesterday, was in response to some statistical analysis uh, and societies. So societies used to say, I demand you transfer a top non-purple card with a uh, concept from your board to my board, if you do draw a card. Um, societies now reads, I demand you transfer a card with a light bulb that is higher than my top card of the same color. From your board to my board. So Societies now forces your opponent to give you a, a card from an age that you've gotten ahead in. Um, and this gives us one more card of the variety that, that can get somebody back in the game if the other player has teched up faster. Uh, and those are really important cards. Uh, the ability to tech up is, is one of the most fun things in innovation. But if you're stuck in the lower ages, you need to have cards that let you sneak back in. And cards like Society and Banking that are the grab a card from your opponent cards are totally those cards. Um, but this gives it a little more teeth and it takes away the non-purple restriction. So Societies can even cover itself up with, you know, somebody's democracy or uh, <laughs> empiricism. Um, like I said, this was a change we actually made yesterday, so I have not tested it yet, uh, but it, it feels correct. So we're going to give that a spin the next couple of days before we get uh, Innovation 3rd Edition off to the press. Um, another card that we changed quite recently is Statistics. So Statistics was one of the weaker considered cards. Uh, it grabbed the highest card from your opponent's score pile and it sent it to their hand and made them do it again if uh, they only had one card. So if their hand was empty and you did statistics on them, you'd get two cards out of their pile. But it was kind of wonky and there's not really... It wasn't that interesting. Uh, it was only punishing people who had empty hands and that wasn't a very interesting punishment point. So now it just says, I demand you transfer all the highest cards from your score pile to your hand. So uh, it does... Sometimes it's more powerful than all statistics, Sometimes it's weaker, and I find that to be more interesting. When we're nerfing or strengthening a card, 
Uh, if we can make that card more interesting, if we can make it so that that card sometimes is better and sometimes is worse, but it depends on how cleverly you use it, that is like our number one way to fix a card. I demand, I demand. Oh no! <laughs> Lana, you ruined the card. Uh, hey, my phone dinged. That's exciting. Uh, yes, we will we will fix that so that there's not a double demand. <laughs> Oops. Uh, yes, yeah, so story behind, so people, a bunch of people asked why were there parrots on the statistics card? Because it didn't make any sense. Um, Carl uh, used to edit textbooks, and one of the math textbooks that he edited on statistics had parrots on the cover, so it was kind of an Easter egg thing. And that's the story. I'm giving away all the innovation secrets. Uh, next up on the nerf wagon is industrialization, which has rece received exactly the same change as fermenting did. Uh, industrialization used to grab and tuck a six for every two factories. Now it does it for each color that you have factories in. Um, mostly for the same reasons as fermenting. Industrialization was one of those cards where if you got it and you had eight factories or 10 factories, you could just like end the game by spamming it over and over again. Now you have to have done a lot more planning to get that going. Um, also, both of those cards now have the case where you could share it with somebody who has more leaps or more factories than you and actually get more draws if you've put yours out uh, in, in more colors, which is neat. Uh, again, that falls into the doctrine of we want cards that are better or worse, but can be used cleverly. Uh, because using cards in a clever fashion is like the core idea of innovation. And we wanted to do it all the places we could. All right, we've got two more cards in the base edition that have changes. Uh, the first wasn't going to get changed, and then, you know, everyone was like, you should really change this. And I'm like, all right, all right, we'll look at it again. Uh, everyone's favorite card, Combustion, probably one of the most powerful cards in the game. Which before read, I demand you transfer two cards from your score pile to my score pile. Uh, it's one of those cards that is, is a stopper for somebody who's grabbed the first four or five achievements. Uh, frequently, you know, somebody will rush one through four. So they've got four achievements, they only need two more to win, maybe they got a special. Um, how do you stop them? You need cards that steal their score pile and get your get you back into the game. And you do that by teching up. Uh, and combustion is like the number one target. If you can get to combustion, you can wipe out your opponent's score pile quickly, or vaccination, or even pirate code. Uh, but it was a little too good for not that much effort to get it out. You know, if you had a combustion with five coins to four, should you really be able to just nuke your opponent's score pile entirely? Uh, no. So what we did is we changed combustion to demand based on the number of cards in your, uh, n the number of uh, coins you have on your board. Uh, so now for every four, you get one card. So combustion can actually wind up being more powerful than it was before if you've got a massive coin advantage. If you have 12, you get three. If you've got 16 coins, uh, you get four cards in their score pile with each activation. Uh, the second part of combustion is the most interesting part of it uh, that we decided to add, which is return your bottom red card. Which means when you activate combustion, you steal a bunch of things and then you have to spend gas. Uh, we love when we can get little thematic bits into a, into a card, and this is a great thematic ad for combustion. It also means that if you're not eligible to demand, like if you get combustion and you have less coins, you can do a force share. So you can put combustion out, share it, force your opponent to return their bottom card. You have to also, and then you get a bonus for sharing because you've made them, you know, buy lots of cards and drive everywhere. Uh, and that was that was a great way to make the card not as strictly powerful, but much more interesting. Uh, again, it allows for clever use. So the last card that we're changing is a minor change to everyone's favorite card. It's Fission! Fission is the card that ruins everything. Um, so all we're changing about Fission is that the, the non-demand um, the non effect now also lets you draw a 10, um, which means that 
you get a little benefit out of it just by activating it. Um, and it, that's fun. It makes vision more interesting to use. Uh, and if it blows up, it blows up. <laughs> that's about all I have to say about vision. <laughs> We we tried some other things, but this is this is the simplest change. It's a very minor uh, tweak to make it more powerful, um, but it should get used more. And who doesn't like nuclear war? All right, everyone. Uh, so that is all of the changes that we've made to the base set so far, and we are pretty confident with this set um, that we don't need to make any more. We've made uh, there are a couple typos and things we fixed too, but that's nothing of note. Um, some people have asked why we haven't changed other cards, uh, and not changing a card is almost harder when there's, you know, public outcry about it. Uh, for example, mathematics. So everyone's like, mathematics is broken, or mathematics is the strongest card in the game, and it's an age two, why do you let that card exist? And mathematics is a good card, but uh, if you look at the stats, it doesn't actually win games uh, at a disproportionate rate. Mathematics, there are lots of ways to punish a player who just straight mathematics techs up. And if you, if you play cleverly, you can do that. It's also a very interesting card uh, because you wind up with a very, very skinny board. Uh, if you're using mathematics to tech up, you're, not, you're spending you know, two actions a turn just to go up one, one age. And if your opponent is grabbing cards in the low ages, like Compass, or uh, now like uh, Feudalism and uh, Machinery, they can steal those cards back and, and force you into a Mathematics fail strategy. Mathematics also has the 1 in 5 chance every, every time it activates to cover itself up. So most of the time, math really isn't a problem. It's a strong card, but it is a fun card and it's a good card. Um, we weren't interested in making sure every single card was of equal strength to every other card. Part of the beauty of innovation is that there are better cards and there are worse cards. There are situational cards, which are bad sometimes and amazing other times. And allowing players to decide which cards are good in the moment is part of what people like a lot. Uh, it's part of what was great for Glory to Rome and Matainai, and it's definitely the core of what makes innovation fun. And if we went and, and you know, pushed every card into this little mix where every three was equal to every other three and every seven was equal to every other seven, we would lose a lot of what makes the game fun. Uh, and I admit, sometimes I fell on the side of wanting perfect balance. Like, it's not fair that that other person won because they drew the card they needed to. Um, but then I'm like, well, you know what? If we, if we do that, why don't we just flip a coin and <laughs> not spend time playing the game? Um, it's much more fun to have, have ways to be smart. Players like to feel clever. You all like to feel clever. I like to feel clever. We like cards that let you do that. So that's what we've got for the base set. Um, the base set uh, is going to go to print fairly soon for the innovation third edition printing. Uh, if you packed at the $16 level, you'll be getting that in late December, early January, depending on how quick the factories turn things over. Um, we've had, uh, there are some delays because it's Christmas season, but we're going to get that out as quick as we can. Excuse me. Um, the other sets, Echoes, Cities, Figures, and Artifacts, we're still working on. But we are ready to share some of the changes we've made to, <laughs> my phone sure likes the ding, to cards from those sets. And uh, that begins with Crossbow, which isn't what I'm showing. I'm showing Barometer because, oops. Good job, stream. So um, Echoes, which was the first expansion for innovation, went through a fairly substantial rule change between version 1 and version 2, uh, which was the setup rules. Originally, you shuffled together base cards and echoes cards uh, in quantities varying by number of players, which meant that at any given time, the top card of each deck would be showing at the back, and you would know that the top one is an echo or the top one is a base card. You know what you're drawing. And a lot of the dogma effects depended on 
that idea and that knowledge. So we're going through all of those cards and sort of changing things that depend on bonuses or um, uh, echo effects to make more sense with the, the updated rules. Something we probably should have done before, but it seemed to work fine enough before. Uh, so we left it. So crossbow is one of the first cards we're changing, uh, which before grabbed a card from a, with a bonus from your opponent's hand to your score pile. Uh, what it does now is do that, and instead of the compensation part, it forces you to transfer a card, you know, you're shooting the crossbow bolt, onto their board. So you can steal cards, uh, but you're spending ammo, kind of. Also, much like the change to combustion, Crossbow now has an interesting second share part, which is if somebody's ahead of you in uh, authority or castles, you can force them to shoot a card onto your board first, uh, and then you can choose to shoot it back, or you can choose to give them a different card, which leads to some very interesting play. Uh, I love the way this card came out. And also, if you're noticing, obviously that giant white three on a black box is not the final art for <laughs> for the bonuses and echoes. We haven't done that yet. Um, we'll be going to that soon. And uh, yeah, no, nothing of the card design is done yet for the expansions. Um, we focused on getting the base set ready because that's going to print first. All right, so next up um, is Watermill. So Watermill is one of those cards uh, that breaks kind of with the new rules. Uh, it lets you tuck a card, draw a card of value equal to the bonus, and if the card has a bonus, repeat the effect. In the old system, when the different decks had different, t different cards on top, like you'd see that the three and four have echoes and five is a non-echo, Watermill would terminate itself by hitting a non-echo card. Uh, now you can set up the situation where you're hitting lots of Echoes cards in a row. So we needed to uh, slow down the effect by making you return a card in addition to repeating the effect. So that makes it harder to repeat Watermill um, over and over again. And that's kind of the change we're making to a lot of these cards. We're just slowing them down so that they don't uh, steamroll through the ages. Because that is the problem that people have seen on Isotropic um, that have played the game hundreds of times and actually have wound up playing more than Carl or I have, which is pretty crazy, but cool. Uh, so that, that's Watermill. We're just changing it to slow it down. Uh, next up is Liquid Fire, which wound up being a little bit weaker than it should be, and it's called Liquid Fire, so it really should be awesome. Um, Liquid Fire has been pretty much wholesale changed. Uh, so now it makes you draw two cards equal to the highest bonus on your board and either put them into my score pile or my forecast, which is really cool. Uh, in order to make that not ridiculously powerful, Liquid Fire also forces you in a non-demand effect to return all of the lower cards from your forecast. So they, they sort of burn away. Um, again, much like the changes to the other two demands that I showed, uh, this non-demand effect on Liquid Fire can be forced as a share. So if your opponent has a lot of forecast cards, for example, if they're using Barometer or um, the one we just, water Watermill, uh, you can Liquid Fire, force a share, make them drop most of their cards, and you get a free card for sharing. Haha. -ha. We like forced shares. Those are the most fun things in innovation to play around with. Um, speaking of cards that were broken, we have Almanac which is probably the most broken card and probably will need to get changed again. We'll see. We're going to test it. Um, so Almanac previously said you may score a card from your forecast with a bonus. If you do, draw and forecast, uh, draw and foreshadow a card of value one higher than that bonus. Um, again, like Watermill, this used to terminate itself by hitting a base card on top of a deck. Now, if you manufacture the situation where you're drawing only uh, Echoes cards, you can quickly jump up to age 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, and we don't want that. <laughs> so now Almanac uh, makes you return your entire forecast in the middle. Uh, so it, it slows itself down, uh, which is good. We might need to change it further. We're going to take a peek at it uh, and start playing some Echoes games after we get base out. That's going to be most of our, uh, <laughs> our fall planning once this uh, cold snap 
sets in and we're not able to go outside anymore because oh my god it was instantly 25 degrees out last night good job october you had one job and that was to be fall and you were winter instead oops um so yeah almanac needs to be slowed down so we slowed down almanac uh another card in the same vein is barometer um So uh, Barometer was a little bit weak, actually. So we wound up doing uh... right. Sorry, this is this is another recent change. Uh, barometer, uh, we now have you foreshadow two cards, um, and it's a little bit better. So that's good because Barometer wasn't getting used. Poor Barometer. And. Finally, we have Fertilizer. And I say finally because these are the cards that we've sort of finalized the changes on, we think. Um, there are probably more cards and Echoes that we're going to wind up changing. Uh, we've got 10 changes in base. I'm sure we're going to get the 10 or 12 in Echoes too. Um, so uh, Fertilizer is the fun card that lets you draw and foreshadow a card of any value. Um, it used to return a card from your hand and send cards to your score pile. Uh, now it just uh, this is this is mostly a wording cleanup. Um, now it grabs all the cards equal to that value uh, and and puts them into your score pile. So right, uh, that is all the changes we've got for echoes. So the last thing I want to talk about is artifacts. So we sort of uh, poked this, we shared in a post on BGG earlier. The draw rules for artifacts previously uh, were, well the first, the first iteration of the draw rules were when you covered up a card with a card of equal value using the meld action, you got to draw an artifact. This proved to be too infrequent and artifacts were cards we wanted people to play because they're fun. Uh, the whole point of playing with the expansion is to get the neat cards out. So we needed it to happen more often. So we adjusted it to be if you meld a card of equal or lower value, um, you would get the you would get an artifact of that age. Um, but what we realized is that the artifacts are largely situational. All of them are really cool, but it would be very helpful to have kind of a choice of which artifact you were getting in some way. Uh, because then you could plan a little bit towards artifacts you're going to try and get. Um, and we had the public card mechanic, which the public cards are five cards that go face up, and you can draw them instead of a card of that age um, once you're able to. So what we decided to do is sort of merge these two mechanics into something called a dig site. So now in artifacts, when you, when you start the game, there is an empty dig site next to each pile from 1 up to 10. Uh, and the first thing you do is fill up the piles for 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 with public cards. Um, so those dig sites are occupied until somebody manages to draw one of those, those public cards. Every time you would trigger an artifact draw, uh, you're digging. We're, gonna, we're, we're thematically saying that when you meld a card on top of a card, and make that pile lower, you're digging for artifacts. When you dig, you fill up all the piles up to the dig value, uh, and the dig value being the card you covered up. So if you cover up a four with a two, you fill up piles one, two, three, and four, the dig sites with an artifact, and you get to pick any one of those to draw into your hand. So the higher you dig, the more cards you get to choose from out of the artifacts, which is really neat from a choice perspective, and also, it means the artifact cards are exposed and you can see what's coming out. So none of the artifacts are a surprise anymore, which is important for some of the cards uh, like Dancing Girl, uh, which can cause an opponent to lose very quickly. Um, and so you can sort of plan for what artifacts are coming out. You can, you can aim for them, which we find to be really interesting. Uh, and the dig site mechanic feels thematically good. So uh, the Artifacts beta is going to be ready. We're aiming for January because uh, we're going to put the, the Deluxe set to print probably in about March uh, to go for the summer release. 
So we'll have a couple of good months of testing from everybody else after we do our internal testing. And, you know, the mechanic will probably evolve some from now till then, but that's, that's what we, we, we're liking that mechanic a lot, and it, it feels good. Um, we're looking at fixing the city's mechanics to have a little more theme, too. Um, cities is fun, but it, it still needs a little bit of tweaking to get it to, to finished. Uh, so somebody asked what's with the fairy logo. So that is Kalyana Asmati, who is the namesake of our company. Uh, and she's also the star of Consequential, which is our upcoming story game, which has been in the works for four years now. And I know we should have it out, but it's not out yet. I am looking to get Consequential onto Kickstarter sometime this winter uh, because it is an awesome idea. Uh, Consequential being a board game that has video, audio, and story content delivered through an app. So you're playing a co-op board game on the table, and the app is feeding you the story and, and sort of interfacing with the game uh, in a lot of the same ways that like XCOM and Alchemist are doing. Uh, so that's why she's there, because Kalyana is awesome. So that is all we have for changes and things for our live stream. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in and asking us some questions. And we're excited to get Innovation Deluxe out to everybody. Uh, the Kickstarter has gone, you know, tremendously awesome. We've broken through all of our stretch goals. We're at 83,563 right now. Um, and we just hit the 24-hour mark. So if you've got friends who didn't get in, tell them to get in. And if you haven't subscribed yet to our YouTube channel, you should do so. So you get notified of uh, future live streams that we'll be doing. We've been having a lot of fun uh, playing games on the table with everybody. Uh, and we're aiming to do that more, uh, especially for things like Impulse and Matinite, that people have been having trouble understanding. I think it's super fun to be able to just watch people play the game and learn from that, because that is often the best way to learn. So, yeah, thank you everybody for watching, and uh, we will talk to you soon. <laughs>